Hello there, Chris here from Becker's Models, and this episode of Talking Models, it's a little fireside chat, and I wish I had a bit of a fire, it's winter down here in Australia. Uh, this little chat that I have every month is just about our hobby in general, how great it is, what things we're going to do to improve, what things are going on, and just this month I was really struggling to come up with an idea to talk about, well actually I did, I've got quite a bit to talk about, as is my want, <laughs> but I came across a, a fantastic, very simple evocative uh, diagram that was written or drawn up by um, a chap. I don't know his, his real name, I just know his internet handle, Moss6510, I believe. Uh, I think he recently subscribed, so how you doing, mate? Uh, he made this great little diagram explaining, kind of saying, did we really have it better in the old days? Have we got it really good these days? Are things too complicated with modeling? Uh, like, you know, should instead of going for the Always going for the U Butte, fantastic, extremely well detailed, complex Tamiya kits of old. Should we, you know, should we go back and hearken for the days of these things, the old Ravel stuff, monogram stuff? So that's what this talking model segment's going to be about. So let's go straight to the bench as I have a face for radio. Well, the bench is actually over there, I should say. And I want to go over Moz's diagram. Let's look at Moz's uh, diagram here I've got on the bench, left hand side. He's describing 1984, no, not the movie, um, or the book, and now 2022, and it's very simple. You know, back then, this is nearly 40 years ago, but you can call it any time, really. You build the model, you spent most of your time, it's actually more than half, I would say. Then you simply paint it, and you add the decals, and you're done. You, um, you know, you put it on the shelf, you hung it from the ceiling, and, well, you do it again. And a lot of folk back then... You didn't really have time to build up a stash because you were going through this process quite quickly. That was modelling. Um, you know, there were a lot of modellers who went a bit further, and I'll talk about them later. Some of the uh, some of the, um, the the big guns back then of of our hobby, but by and large, yeah, that was it. And I think uh, he's he's on he's on the money there a little bit. But now, well, things have changed. Building seems to only be you know a small part of the, of the total experience. In fact. Building out of the box these days, you get the kit box and you just build it as it is. It seems to be a thing of the past. Well, that's the perception. Is that completely true? I don't know. I think there's a lot of modelers out there who do exactly that. And I've talked to a few uh, recently. For example, uh, Tom Hutchins, um, who does um, kit in the box, kit box. Oh, sorry, Tom got it wrong, but I'll put a link. That's what he does. And he, he creates some fantastic models, but he just does them out of the box. Now, today, there's just a plethora, and I love that word, of aftermarket available. I mean, you've got resin parts, you've got photo which you've got metal barrels, you've got 3D printed parts, including uh, these new raised cockpit panels. So, you know, you can, t uh, you don't have to paint the cockpit parts anymore. You just put the, the decal down and it's got all these raised switches and so forth. I mean, not only that, from the adding to the build side to do the super detailing, the hyper detailing, I mean, we've now developed over the years all these um, huge variety of painting and weathering styles and elements and products to apply. I mean, you've got your pre-shading, post-shading, chipping, uh, washes, filters, rust effects, streaking, dirt, dust, mud, exhaust stains, oil stains. I mean, different ways of painting, different products to apply. You've got um, a lot of people now using inks, you know, and acrylics and, uh, you know, it's just... It's, uh, it's just so much. And then, you know, as, as he's put down here, maybe you've, you've got to make a base and you've got to do a diorama for it. You've got to create the whole picture. I mean, do you sometimes feel like this is just so overwhelming that sometimes, that somehow, if you only do the model on the left, you're not as good as someone who does, who does or tries to do everything on the right? It's unfortunately exacerbated by social media, including this. You know, you're watching me rattle, rattle on about this. I mean, it's so widespread. You've got your Facebook, Instagram, whatever you use. In your face, countless. Just, you know, keep scrolling with that finger, you know, up and down your phone or on your your, your iPad or whatever, and you just see countless well-made, exciting, really scale models photographed brilliantly, and they just keep coming at you across the feeds. Boom, 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 boom. And those are the ones that stick out, the ones that you see on this side. You don't see too many out-of-the-box build, or if you do, you sort of flash by them and you get, get to this side instead. Now, there's different approaches, there's different levels of creativity going on there, and different layers beyond, you know, the simple build it and paint it. I mean, I call this maybe old school. Is that a bad way to call it? Old school? Is that a, is that a pejorative term? Is that a bad way to say it? Well, I want to use this opportunity to try to describe how not only is this 
development. It's true. It's, you know, well, we've just, just explained it. But I want to put my take on it and, you know, try to explain that, that modeling is not just one hobby anymore. It used to be basically this. Okay, and there were a few exceptions to the rule, but majority of people will do this. But I want to get it down that not everyone does this. Okay, don't be pressured that you have to do everything to every model. So I'm going to flip this over and show you my diagram. Now I've made what's called a linear Venn diagram for the mathematicians out there. You might understand what this is, but there's also a moon. No, it's not a space station. There's a moon hanging out over there. And I want to use this to do a very broad, generalized sort of understanding of how I see the hobby as it stands today. And to try to explain some of the hostility that we see out there, some of the contentions that people have between, you know, people, oh, you over weather that model. Oh, that looks completely unrealistic. Oh, that's just, that just looks ridiculous or whatever, you know, and some of the groups overlap. Some of them are not defined. I mean, I tried a few different variations here, some different sketches uh, to try to explain this, but this is about the simplest way I can do it. The fundamental thing, um, underneath all this is we all build scale models either we I mean there are a few sort of maybe I should have put another moon out there the um, the, the epic scratch builders that do it from scratch that's a whole I think it's a whole different model whole different hobby in of itself but let me just get straight into it I think that basically there's three types of modelers okay and this is not a judgment call this is not to say that if you're on this side of the spectrum you're better than this no this is without judgment. We reserve our judgment for the art world. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the replica makers. And that's the, I've purposely put it on the left side here because that's basically how that diagram was before, the, the 1984 crowd. Okay, the, the replica makers, these are the folks who just want to make a scale model, model replica of a thing. Um, I mean, in the past, yes, yeah, some people would scratch build the whole thing. But let's just talk about, you know, uh, plastic models. And done straight out of the box, you know, let's just make a Sherman, let's make an F-18, or let's make a battleship. I mean, these modelers are just really happy to just build something that looks like the real thing. Um, you know, paint it, put the decals on, call it a day. Now, the detail to, is important. I mean, let's not say, you know, it has to be a block of soap. But, you know, it's more about getting a, a representation, not necessarily a complete exact scale down replica um, model, you know, I mean, any non-modeler would look at it and say, oh, hey, that's a great model of a Sherman Hornet battleship. There's an extension to this category, of course, sometimes we call them a rivet counter uh, in a pejorative sense, but I would actually call them that, that group who are really dedicated about getting the exact precision right, nothing else, that's all they're involved in, getting a really good, um, I call them super detailers, but you know, they, they're the ones who are after the most exact replica uh, they can make. I'll talk about that a bit later. Let's move on to the next batch. Now the next type of modeler, they're going for a scale model replica too. That's why you got the overlap with the replica guys. But they want to add as much realism as possible. And what does that mean? What does realism mean? Well, basically to any modeler looking at, uh, or a layman, you know, a non-modeler looking at, you know, with the right lighting, the right photography, they're, they're, they're sort of tricked into thinking, hey, that almost looks real. You know, you sort of get that sort of, what's what's that gap they use in uh, <laughs> in CGI, that sort of, you know, that, that, that uh, I can't remember the name, I should think of it. You'll tell me in the comments, whatever that gap is, but the uncanny, the uncanny valley, where you go, hang on, that valley's almost been crossed. That uncannily looks like the real thing. Now this requires a lot of effort. It's a lot of work to do that. And it goes way beyond the fundamental just building skills required to complete a model. I mean, depending on the subject or the kit itself, that road to realism involves adding multiple layers of you know different types of shapes and sizes of detail. You might be going all the way down to tiny photo etch parts to um, uh, adding just you know huge amounts of, of extra detail that's not in the kit. Uh, to also creating layers of texture, of more color variation, realistic weathering patterns. I mean, these are the things that trick your eye into going, hang on, that's just not a plastic model with a bit of paint on it. That's something else. Something's being pushed forward. And it's all about telling a story about that subject. Now, this is a very broad church of modelers, okay? We're not talking about a very slim amount of realists. It is, you know, there's various approaches, there's various levels of dedication to bring about a truly realistic scale model. Some people spend, uh, for example, Will Patterson, he's building a Super Hornet at the moment. And I don't know how many, 
hundreds of hours he spent trying to get that thing together, whereas some people might only just do 20 hours. It's still a lot, you know, they might spend a week or two trying to get the weathering and the painting right, uh, but not worry about certain other details. So, you know, sometimes this sort of broad approach, it, it puts off some of the replica maker guys. And, you know, you can understand it for, for a little bit because they don't understand the intent of what's going on here. They think, oh, that's overdone, that's overweathered. You know, with an un without that understanding of understanding of they're not these people aren't trying to build a desktop rep replica. They're trying to make something that, once you look at it from a certain angle and you know under that right sort of conditions, it looks real. And you know, there's a we've come a long way where uh, some some of the old uh, diorama makers and so forth. I mean, they were they were artists in of themselves. We won't go into the art debate just yet. You know, we've come a long way because there's been so much of a sharing of, of what's available in this circle, in this spread here. And some people forget that the realists aren't, they're not trying to go for a stylized finish. No, no, no. They're actually going for a realistic finish. And the other thing that's really helped this group of modelers in recent years is, well, you know, the sharing of information in social media, but also reference photos. Particularly if you want to build anything that's been out there for the last 20 years, uh, high definition photography does not lie most of the time. <laughs> you can Photoshop things here and there. There is so much reference photos available that you, when someone says, oh, that's over weathered, you know, someone can come up with a thousand photos saying, hang on, here it is. This is what it exactly looks like from this angle, this angle, this angle, this angle. There's no more, you know, a black and white photo of a Messerschmitt going through the air in 1940. So let's move on to that last group and I'll wrap it up with my explanation of how this kind of works. The final bunch of modelers are what I like to call the stylists. I, I say that instead of calling them the artists because it's, it's a little bit different. Um, they literally want to make a really cool, striking, you know, that high wow factor model. And while they have a bit of an overlap with the realists here using the painting and the weathering techniques that they use, and it's a major part of their toolbox, it's really used to leapfrog over and go into that hyper real stylistic finish. Now this may or may not include adding extra details, it might be done out of the box, but it almost certainly uses the application of much more artistic painting and finishing techniques, a lot of which are borrowed from the figure painting world, which I'm not talking about here, this is, I'm talking about scale modelling military and civilian scale modelling. So for most stylists, that fundamental build that seems to be the uh, what the replicas guys seem to have their, you know, anchor all their sort of expectations on. That's only one step out of a hundred to get to what they want, you know, that chef's kiss sort of finish. So before I go on and, and talk about how this all works and how we can sort of normalize what's going on in the hobby, what's this little moon doing up here? Well, <laughs> that's where the artist lives and perhaps you could put them in, in, there's some replica makers out there who can make an absolutely jaw-dropping, um, you know, crack, this, and a, you know, one-fifth scale Spitfire or a, a you know, one thirty-second scale scratch-built aircraft or what have you. And you know, we're starting to move <laughs> out of the hobby and get into a completely different area where this is a, a, the base, but you know, they're going way out there. And then there's also the the stylists who come up with a story. Of for example, my absolutely favourite model that I've ever seen is Rick Lawler's. Um, one with a Holocaust uh, survivor who's carting away the uh, the empty crates of all the all the clothes at the uh, at in front of the um, the railroad. I mean, it's a figure and a and a cart and a railroad carriage. You know, all parts that you used in any sort of model but put together. It's art. So I'm going to leave that for another discussion another day. There's been a lot of uh, airwaves and a lot of talk about is modeling art. I'll leave that for another time, but let's get into how we can address, how we can solve the problem of getting back to, can we get back to making this more fun? I don't know, let's have a chat. Now, before you accuse me of waxing nostalgic about saying, oh, the past was better, we had it better back in the old days, I'm not. In fact, there's a great video essay done by Paul Budzik on exactly that, about don't look back <laughs> at what the modeling, um, was like back then, so go and check it out. I'll leave a uh, description in the link below. Kits have gotten tremendously better in the last 40 years. There's no denying that. There's a few stragglers out there who haven't got that good. <laughs> I won't say who they are. <coughs> no, they're, they're doing better, they're doing better. Um, you know, there's no question that say a modern Tamiya kit or even any brand name kit is, you know, 
miles ahead better than what they were 40 years ago. Uh, the fit is just amazing now. The engineering has really come up. The molding quality has gone ahead in leaps and bounds and the accuracy. I mean, we still have some problems here and there, but you know, by and large, because there's more information out there, because there's more, um, there's just more detail available on things, the accuracy levels of our kits have gone up tremendously. And which is a good thing because we all can investigate the internet and all our resources and references and know, because back then when you were building a kit, unless you were, you know, unless you flew the thing or you or used that tank, apart from occasional magazine photo or article, you didn't really know what the thing looked like until you got it out of that kit box. So our expectations were a lot lower back then. Now, as Paul said in his essay, things have gotten a lot better since the 1980s, but it begs a question, why does it seem so hard sometimes to finish a kit or get that same level of enjoyment we did as a child or a teenager back when the kits weren't as good? It might be that we just have an abundance of choices available to us. I mean, that right-hand pie on Moz's diagram is full, okay? There's, you know, we just feel so committed to finishing something and, and adding all these must-haves and add-ons and changes and, and things that, you know, we seem to just, just be overwhelmed with all this choice that has to be done. I always jokingly said that the secret to happiness, secret to life in general, is to lower your expectations and enjoy what you've got, okay, or what you can get. But on the other side, um, there's something to be said about, you know, increasing your skill level and having that triumphant feeling of, of finishing something really epic, something that you've put a lot of effort into. So, you know, where do we go with this? I'll give you an example. Uh, if you've been following my build log, I'll put the link up here or down below of my Academy 148 scale CH53E, which is spread out all over my workbench over there. I mean, it is a slog and I'm throwing everything but the kitchen sink, but about 10,000 rivets at that thing. And... You know, after a while, it doesn't seem to feel like I'm enjoying it. It feels like work. You know, there's a lot to be done. And I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm just adding everything. And have I cooked my own goose with it? So let's, you know, um, extend that really bad cooking analogy out. And my solution here is to put both hands in, in both pies, okay? I think that you should have, keep that one project that, that you've got, you're putting all your energies, all your aftermarket, all the research, you know, the countless hours you spend on the computer trying to find out all the right details and, you know, researching the aftermarket and, and asking people, what should I do? How do I paint this? What's the best weathering technique? Do all that. Don't, I'm, I'm not saying stop that. But I think along that journey, have at your disposal another kit. Have another kit where you're gonna say, all right, I'm going to build this out of the box. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything to this thing. I'm going to literally get that kit. Maybe I'll buy a mask set. Maybe, maybe about it. Maybe just do one thing. Maybe you decide, okay, maybe I'll add, if it's a tank, a metal barrel. Or maybe I'll just swap out the tracks. If it's got, you know, rubbish rubber band tracks or, you know, plastic link and length, I'll just get some metal tracks. tracks. Just do one thing. But, you know, do the whole thing out of the box. Just paint it. Just put the decals on it and put it on the shelf call it a day and then get back to your other project. You know, you can do them alongside, whatever, whatever you feel is the right way to do it. Now, I'm a Tamiya fanboy, you know that. <laughs> You've seen what I, what I recommend on the channel, all my links about saying you should always start off with a Tamiya kit first. But I'm actually recommending an Airfix kit this time. I'm, I've, I've built, it's done, well, it's ready for, um, for primer and then final assembly. I built the Airfix Walrus. I mean, this has been a delightful build. Yes, it's the usual Airfix, you know, let's just, Call a spade a spade. It's really poor quality control. Still haven't improved in that area. Everything else has more or less improved. The plastic is still rubbish and the molding quality is a bit off. I mean, almost every other part, not every part, has a mold seam or it has some sort of flash. I mean, it's easy to fix. It's a bit of a pain, but you know, use an SMS scraper, the ceramic scraper, uh, and just take a little bit of extra time and it works out. But the fit and the engineering, hey, top notch. Can't, can't complain. They did a really good job and you know, just a few nights away from the bench from the, the big behemoth, and I've got this thing ready for primer. And I'm gonna build it completely out of the box. I've got a mast set for it, that's it. I might not even add the rigging. I'll, I'll actually do it wheels down, or maybe I'll just leave the wheels on, and I might do a water display for it, you know, some way down the track. But I'll finish it, I'll throw it in the cupboard, I'll be really happy, and that's what I recommend you should do. It's about trying to keep your enjoyment up in the hobby. So what do you think about this whole concept of, you know, increasing your enjoyment of the hobby and, you know, trying to, don't look back to what the hobby was, go look forward to what it is now and, and also an understanding of, you know, there's more than one hobby. I mean, some people say I'm off base by saying there is only one hobby. Yeah, okay, there is only one hobby. There's facets to it. 
But what I'm trying to say is not, you know, one person is like with the Airfix Walrus, you know, someone's going to build that and detail it up in the head. And I've seen plenty of builds. They've, you know, they've, they've detailed it up to the wazoo. They've, they've gone for full realism. I've seen some people go full stylistic, overly weathered build. I've seen some people just do it out of the box, put it on the shelf. Three different approaches, same kit. Okay. There's room for that in our hobby for that. If you want to call it a hobby or whatever, I don't care. Um, so yeah, let, let me know your thoughts on this. Let me know if my solution or just having something else to the side, having that, we call it the squirrel, you know, the old distraction kit on the side. Don't let it go too far. Like I've got, I only just, I only don't just have the walrus <laughs> underway. I have quite a few other things, including another airfix kit that's as old as me. And I'm really looking forward to sharing that one with you guys soon on that one. Anyway, I'm rabbiting on. This is a great subject to talk about. I want, I do want to talk about is the whole modeling art things. So I want to expand on that idea eventually and give my thoughts on it. I have a strong opinion, but weakly held. <laughs> That's how I'd call it on that. Just like my in-flight aircraft thing. It's a very strong opinion I have, but I weakly, he weakly hold it because I can be persuaded that it's, you know, maybe I'm not that correct on it. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Leave some comments below, like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. You know, the whole drill with YouTube. Sometimes people watch the video, some people, sometimes they don't, they miss it. So if you are a subscriber, make sure you, the, I think this is still the bell there. I don't know. Anyway, have a great day. Enjoy your hobby and I'll see you next time.